Let's talk about some ventricular volumes here. So we can speak about the volume in the ventricle um, at different phases during the cardiac cycle. So the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that has filled into the ventricle at the end of diastole. So this is at the end of the filling phase. Um, the end systolic volume is going to be the volume of blood that is remaining in that ventricle at the end of systole. Remember, systole is the ejection phase. So basically, end systolic, end systolic volume is how much blood is left in the ventricle after I've ejected blood into the artery. Whereas end diastolic volume is how much blood is in the ventricle before I eject or at the end of the filling before I eject blood into the artery. And if we look at those two volumes, we can then deduce stroke volume. So stroke volume is essentially how much blood was actually ejected. So if I take how much was left at the end of diastole, so how much filled into the chamber to begin with, and I subtract how much was left at the end of systole, so how much was ejected into the artery or out of that ventricle, then I can essentially deduce how much was actually ejected, right? So end diastolic minus end systolic gives us stroke volume. And in terms of our typical cardiac volumes, that's about 130 milliliters minus 60 milliliters. And that gives us about 70 milliliters actually being ejected out to our systemic organs. Now, in terms of looking at when we record these two volumes, end diastolic and end systolic, that's going to be during at the end of uh, phase one. So at the end of phase one, this is where the AV valves have closed. The semilunar valves have also closed. And so the blood has, the uh, filling phase has ended. And that's when we want to capture the end diastolic volume, so the end of phase one. As far as the end systolic volume, we want to capture this at the end of ventricular ejection. So the end of phase three, after blood has left the ventricles and then the semilunar valves close once again, that's when we want to record or capture the end systolic volume because that is what is left back in the ventricle at the end of systole. Okay, so EDV we record at the end of phase one, ESV we record at the end of phase three. And then from those two volumes, we can further deduce um, by calculating um, the stroke volume. We can then look at another uh, value here in terms of those volumes. So this is the ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction is the fraction of end diastolic volume ejected during a heartbeat. So if we look at the volume that was ejected, our stroke volume, which is about 70 milliliters, and we look at that as a fraction of our total filling volume, so our end diastolic volume, which we know to be 130 milliliters, we can say that about 0.45 of that um, is ejected, and that is called the ejection fraction. So basically, how much of the blood that was filled into the ventricle is actually ejected? And we know that about 54%, or 0.54, of the total filling volume is what is actually ejected. So another way of saying that is the heart never actually empties. The heart fills 130 milliliters of blood into the ventricle, and it only empties or ejects about 70 milliliters, which is about 54%. Now this is at rest. So this is typical, what happens typically as we're doing our day-to-day -day activities. But if we are under strenuous activity, if we're exercising, if there's a fight or flight response being elicited, we can increase this ejection fraction so that the heart would actually eject more, maybe 60 um, or higher, percentage of that end diastolic volume as our organs will demand more um, oxygen um, or more blood flow. 
So here is a little graph that kind of represents that. So we've got the total filling volume being 130 milliliters. And again, we would record that ADV at the end of phase one. Um, we've got all, well, not all, 54% of that being ejected during phase three. And that takes us back down to about 60 milliliters. Again, we record that at the end of phase three. And that is our end systolic volume. And as we can see, there's 60 milliliters of blood that's left back in the ventricle because the heart doesn't actually empty. It only empties about 54% of that total volume, which is about 70 milliliters. And then once again, it fills. So that filling volume takes us right back up to our end diastolic volume. And that cycle happens again and again and again. Okay, so one of the last things we'll speak about here is the pressure volume, actually, no, this is not the last thing. So the pressure volume curve um, is one of the uh, important parts of correlating the pressure and the volume in the left ventricle specifically. Now we're gonna be looking at the left ventricle because the left ventricle, again, is telling a more important story as it relates to our systemic circulation. Um, so we've got phase one where the ventricular volume is increasing from 60 milliliters to 130 milliliters. And if you look at this graph here, we can see that if we plot the ventricular pressure on the y-axis and we plot the ventricular volume on the x-axis and we correlate those two um, variables, this first curve shows us what happens in phase one. So phase one, which is ventricular filling, we can see that the volume rises, as, that makes sense, right? As the ventricle fills more blood, the volume goes from 60 milliliters, which is our end systolic volume, all the way to 130 milliliters, which is our end diastolic volume. Um, the pressure slightly rises, right? But not by a whole lot the volume more importantly is what rises rapidly as that blood fills into the ventricle. If we look at phase two, we can see the volume remains constant. And if you remember, this is that isovolumetric ventricular contraction phase. So we said here that all four valves are closed, therefore blood is not moving, therefore volume remains constant. So there's no change in our uh, volume, but there is drastic change in the pressure as the ventricle begins to contract. So the ventricle contracts, there's a steep rise in pressure, no change in volume, and that takes us to phase three. Phase three is where we have ventricular ejection. So once again, looking at volume and pressure here, we can see that the pressure is going to slightly rise as the ventricle contracts. The volume is going to decrease as blood leaves that chamber. So we can see that the curve is now taking a backwards turn, which is telling us that volume is dropping, um, but pressure is slightly rising. And then towards the end of that, pressure falls off as volume continues to drop, okay? And this is indicating blood is leaving the ventricle and moving out into the artery. And then that brings us all the way back full circle to phase four. Here, there's once again, no change in volume. This is another isovolumetric phase, isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. So we have volume remaining the same, but pressure drastically falling as the ventricle relaxes and gets right back down to phase one, which is where we start the cycle all over again. So the pressure volume loop or the pressure volume curve um, is an important indicator of correlating the pressure and the volume um, and is a, an important indicator of the function of the left ventricle. Now in certain pathologies, we'll see this curve shift to the right as more blood fills into the ventricle, or it can shift to the left as the walls of the chamber become so rigid and so thick that they don't fill adequately and the, and the volume decreases. So we can 
excuse me, we can see different shifts in this curve as we have different pathologies happening in the heart. So during heart failure, if we've got white heart failure where we have more blood filling into the heart, um, we can see this curve shift to the right. And again, if we have a stiff ventricle that's not filling adequately, we can see this curve shift to the left as the volume decreases. Lastly here, we'll speak about the heart sounds. So the heart sounds, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, are due to the turbulence of blood flow that hits against the back of a closing valve. So the first heart sound is a soft lub, and this happens as the closure of the AV valve, so the bicuspid and tricuspid valves. As those two valves close simultaneously, we have an increase in the pressure that kind of gets a little bit of blood to kind of hit against the back of those closing valves. And that is what creates that turbulence that we appreciate as the heart sound. The second heart sound is a little bit louder and it's a little bit shorter. And that is where we have the closure of the semilunar valves. So this, this is where the aortic and pulmonary valves close simultaneously. Once again, we have a little bit of pressure that creates a thrust or a gust of blood um, towards the back of those closing valves. Um, and that creates the turbulence that we appreciate as the second heart sound. So the, the heart sound together is more of a softer, longer lub and a louder, shorter dup. So it's a lub dup, lub dup, lub dup, right? So there's a difference in the pitch of those two sounds and then the length of those sounds as well. And these are the sounds that your, doc your doctor is actually listening for as they listen to your heart. And that's gonna indicate a lot about your cardiovascular health, the state of your valves, the amount of pressure that's being um, exerted on the walls of the ventricle and atria, as well as the volume of blood that's moving through. And we can have different states of the valves. I'm sure you've heard of um, stenosis of the valves, which is where the valves get very uh, tight and they don't move as easily. And that creates a different heart sound. We can also have uh, regurgitation where the valves get really leaky and they kind of open and close without those pressure gradients. That also creates a continuous heart sound, which should not be. We should only hear the uh, first heart sound during diastole, um, at the end of diastole rather, and the second heart sound at the end of systole. So here we can see that a little bit better. So we've got the uh, uh, opening of the closing rather of the AV valves giving us sound one, and then the closure of the semilunar valves giving us heart sound two. Okay, so that is all we're gonna look at in terms of the cardiac cycle. Um, on Friday we'll meet, we'll look at the cardiac output, which is the last packet of the cardiovascular system. And I uh, will probably try to spend some time doing some practice questions either before or after um, we speak on Friday. I got a, quite a few questions. Um, we'll probably look at them all together. So we'll probably reserve probably the last 30 minutes of class on Friday. I'll take any questions you may have. I'll review a few important topics for the um, exam four, and then we'll practice a few questions. Um, so wherever we get to at the end of that first 30 minutes on Friday, We'll probably call it a day there and then we'll spend that last 30 minutes um, doing a bit of review.